Hello there, and welcome to video number three, in which we're going to look at the multiple lines of evidence that we can use to show that evolution is true. So building upon some of the philosophical questions that we saw in the last video, we're going to be looking here at the evidence for natural selection and evolution, and how well supported a theory this is. So what lines of evidence can we use to support evolution? Well, there are ma many, many, there are myriad lines of evidence that we can use to support evolution. The first one that I've highlighted here is the fossil record. The fossil record provides us with a wealth of evidence for evolution because the history of life on Earth is recorded in rocks and we can follow lineages through layers of rock as they evolve. We can thus watch evolutionary processes through time on both a large and a small scale. I've put a couple of examples on this slide. On a large scale, we can see big transitions such as the evolution of birds from within the dinosaurs. The fossil record, which is um, uh, quite complete for this transition, shows us the accumulation of changes as this occurs. The modifications of the forelimbs and the evolution of flight feathers, such as those shown in this reconstruction on the bottom right here, as well as the changes to the skeleton, which are summarised on this diagram on the left here, um, as well as larger brains and changes in gait based on the limbs and the development of the beak, are all recorded in the fossil records from within a group of the dinosaurs to what we recognise as the first birds. But we can also see this on a smaller scale. So on the right hand side, you can see some examples of um, micro fossils uh, with time running from the uh, bottom through to the top here, and uh, some lines here that show differences in shape and disparity, that's the range of different morphologies within a species of foraminifera. This is a single celled organism that creates uh, calcium carbonate um, shell that's called a test which we'll be meeting in the last video um, for this series of videos in fact. And here you can see a gradual change in shape through time within this single lineage of organisms. So in short we can see the impact of evolution at multiple scales when we look back into geological time. And of course I'm a paleontologist so I would say this, but the fossil record I think is unique and the timescales along which it allows us to observe evolution. But we're, just, we're not just limited to the fossil record. The theory of evolution was proposed before we had the understanding of genetics that we have today. For example, Charles Darwin had no idea about the existence of DNA, and indeed for him, how variation was passed on between generations was a major outstanding question for the veracity of his idea, the theory of evolution. All of the discoveries we've made in the realm of genetics since that point have completely supported his idea of evolution by natural selection. On the left, I illustrate this with a rather old paper from 1984 that shows a diagram showing how closely related different uh, primates are from uh, humans are here, and we've got chimps, gorillas, etc, etc. Um, this shows the relationship, and on the bottom here you can see the sequence similarity um, of their DNA, so how similar the DNA sequences are to each other. And you can see, for example, that the, um, the two chimps in this analysis have the most similar DNA. The next most similar is the sequence of humans and chimps, then gorillas relative to, um, to chimps and humans. So as you can see, there's this kind of nested similarity of DNA that supports the idea that she, each one of these different groups, things that are called clades, which we'll learn about uh, in our phylogeny lecture, are more similar to each other than they are to everything else. And this all supports this idea of, um, of evolution. Indeed, we can actually use that similarity to infer evolutionary histories nowadays, given that this is such a well-resolved um, picture. And it's something that works on many scales. 
On the right hand side here, this tree, you can see a tree of vertebrates in which the lengths of the branches on the tree show the amount of genetic change between any two species. So between um, a dog, human and a mouse, um, there is, and elephant and armadillo, there is a significant amount of change between those organisms and opossums, for example. So this and many other discoveries we have made in the world of genetics provide excellent evidence that evolution is taking place. And in recent years, we've been able to do this on a bigger scale than ever before due to something called high throughput sequencing. It's a real growth field which over time and time again reinforces our view of evolution as the correct answer to explain biodiversity. We can also support the existence of evolution through biogeography. Now, we cover this in another series of videos on this course, but if you've already watched those uh, or you've sat through the lecture, we know that biogeography is the distribution of organisms through space. So, and that provides excellent evidence for evolution. And that's because we find organisms in places that make sense in light of the evolution of those groups and their geological history. So an example on the left hand side here is Hawaiian crickets. If we say use the DNA to build the tree of life for this group, again we'll learn about that in our lectures on phylogeny, we find that the earliest branching group is found on the earliest island in Hawaii. Then we find that the other groups share a common ancestor that's about the same age as this younger island here. And it looks like this younger island has then eventually been the source for crickets that went on to live on the purple, blue and red island in one grouping and the blue and red island in another grouping. So all of this makes sense given the age of the islands um, coupled with this evolutionary tree we can, re we can recover. We see this pattern in deep time too, as we've learned in quite a lot of detail in the paleobiogeography videos. The study of the distribution of fossils um, essentially makes sense in deep time on the scale of continents based on what we understand of past continental configurations. Sometimes we do explain these by the distribution of fossils, but they're explained by a, a large other number of other lines of evidence, such as paleomagnetism or the, uh, the way the continents fit together, for example. And all of this builds this picture of um, evolution occurring deep over geological time. There are also many examples of suboptimal or very kind of poor arrangements in the natural world, but which makes sense in the light of evolution. And they make sense in the light of evolution if we think of this as incremental changes to or kind of the tinkering with of organisms and morphology. A very famous example is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So this is a nerve that controls our larynx, our voice box, um, allowing us to talk and swallow. I'm using it a lot as I speak to you right now. And in humans, it loops down from the, the brain, around the aorta in the heart, and back up to the larynx. That's an example of really poor design. It's tens of centimeters longer than it actually needs to be to do the job that it's doing in humans. And if we take something with a very long neck, for example, a giraffe, shown on the right hand side here, this single nerve is meters long going from the brain all the way down and then back up um, to the larynx. Why might this be the case? Well, in our ancestors living in the ocean, we were fish-like creatures, and this nerve lined up with a blood vessel. Both this nerve and this blood vessel were associated with a single gill. During the course of evolution, this vessel moved kind of downwards relative to our body plan today, I guess it makes sense to say, and the nerve had to remain behind it. So the nerve can't cross that vein without breaking, and breaking that nerve is maladapted but it was still needed, the nerve, to connect what was a gill arch and ultimately became the larynx to the brain. And so over the course of several hundred millions of years of evolution, as this vein moved down, the nerve has looped longer and longer, and in the case of the giraffe, very, very, very long way round um, to do the job that it needed to continue doing to not be maladaptive. 
interestingly, this nerve actually has cells which travel its entire length. So in a giraffe especially, that is one very big cell. But this is just one example of many, many I could have chosen to demonstrate um, kind of what we may consider poor design without implying that these things are designed. If you want to learn more, um, learn about our eyes versus those of cephalopods, for example, or any form of vestigial trait. So there are a large number of imperfections that support evolution. We can also do experiments in evolution to try and understand the process better. And that allows us to formulate and then test hypotheses, which is really, really valuable. Many experiments with evolution use bacteria. These have advantages in that they have a faster generation time than complex organisms such as animals. A very famous example of a bacterial experiment is called the Long-Term Evolution Experiment, or LTEE, which we'll meet elsewhere in our lectures for this course in the context of adaptations. But this has shown us many interesting things about the nature of evolution. So this is an experiment where essentially a population of bacteria is moved to a new plate of agar jelly every day and has been uh, moved between plates of agar jelly every day for the last 27 years now. I think it started in, I believe, 1988. Um, anyway, so it's been going for a while. And this allows us to study evolution in this group. And what it's shown us is that, for example, I've got four points here. In the absence of environmental change, the rate of fitness gain declines over time. That's shown on the left-hand side here, where you can see the relative fitness of these organisms relative to the starting um, organisms of the experiment. And over 50,000 generations, fitness goes up at first very strongly, but then it slows down but then continues going up relatively slowly. It's actually something that's called a power law relationship. And that's a really interesting finding. In these populations, because there are, there are eight repeats of this experiment going on at the same time, multiple beneficial, beneficial variants simultaneously compete for dominance in each population. The targets of natural selection seem to have changed over time, both due to the interaction of genes within these bacteria and through historical contingency, um, which changed the strength of selection on different genes. Altogether, this experiment suggests to us that long-term adaptation, even in a constant environment, is quite complex. It's a really, this is a really elegant and quite famous example of experimental evolution. While it's harder to do these experiments with animals, for example, due to the timescales evolved, there are examples of such experiments. One super cool example has been running for the last 60 years and is led by a team of Russian geneticists um, in, at the moment being led by Lyudmila Trutt. Uh, and this is working on silver fox domestication, so looking at silver fo foxes and selecting those to be domestic. It has identified, for example, many of the traits that we associate with domestic animals. Um, these are often placed together into a, a, a kind of a, a suite of traits called domestication syndrome, which we actually covered in the Evolution 101. Examples of those include floppy ears. This is Mechta, which is the first domesticated fox to have floppy ears in 1969, and juvenilized facial characteristics. This has resulted in an interesting debate about the nature of domestication syndrome in recent years, as well as insights into the developmental mechanisms at play. You can see an overview of the experiment in this paper here, and you can see some of its uh, impacts in terms of our understanding of domestication syndrome in this paper here, if you so wish. But it's a really good example of experimental evolution with animals. Of course, those experiments on animals are actually very similar indeed to selective breeding for food, which isn't an experiment per se, um, but it is something that we do as humans to make organisms more palatable to us to eat. We covered this in Evolution 101, if you were there. So many, many foods, most of the crops and the animals that we eat, have been artificially selected to be more edible for humans. This is beautifully de demonstrated, I think, in the art uh, of years gone by. So in this example of a painting on the left by Giovanni Stanchi, you can see what a watermelon looked like in the 17th century. This is nowhere near as good as the, the giant seedless watermelons that we get today in terms of what we may like to eat. 
Um, and that's because we've um, selected the best watermelons for cultivation and consumption. Another fine example is maize. You can see very clearly the difference between what we now eat on the right hand side here and its precursor shown here. So I should highlight, of course, that this is not a natural process um, because humans are involved, but it follows many of the same principles as natural selection. It's just that it's humans guiding that selection in these examples. Um, and they select the traits that they value. We select the traits that we value in food. So that supports evolution as well. And of course, none of these lines of evidence are happening in a vacuum. In all systems that we've ever studied in terms of life sciences, there are multiple independent lines of evidence to support the theory of evolution. And that makes this a very, very compelling theory. When we have multiple independent lines of evidence that are agreeing on a conclusion, this is something that we often call consilience in science. So, as an example, these are members of a group called the arthropods. They're united by having jointed limbs, exoskeletons, um, and a large number of other shared derived characteristics. And we have independent lines of evidence that these are more closely related to each other than they are to any other animals. So you can see the major living groups here, insects, uh, myriapods, so that's centipedes and millipedes, and their kin, crustaceans, crabs, prawns, and lobsters, and um, arachnids, chelicerates, and their kin on the uh, left-hand side here. And these four groups all share these features. Um, so there's evidence that they're more closely related to each other than they are to other organisms based on their physiology, but also based on their morphology, their anatomy. That's supported also by their genomes, which we sequence many of these now. It's supported by the biogeography of the group, and by their molecular biology. So there are many lines of evidence supporting this as a grouping, and all of that is in turn supported by, but independent of, the fossil record of this group. In the fossil record of this group, summed up in this lovely diagram by Ernst Haeckel, we see these animals appear in the Cambrian from a common ancestor. We see the different lineages that I introduced in the last slide that were alive today differentiate from each other within the fossil record. And then as the fossil record gets younger and younger and closer today, we see all of the living orders, then families, then genera, and then species appear as we follow these lineages through time. That's about as compelling as evidence can possibly get for any scientific idea. Despite the compelling nature of that evidence, there are, of course, still people that do not accept the evidence that I have presented to you today. A prominent example I could have chosen several others, but a prominent example are the creationists within the United States of America. So this shows a poll um, of the US population um, by Gallup showing that the majority, I suppose, for a high 40% of Americans believe that God created humans in their present form. So although um, this group are by no means the only group of people whose ideology doesn't sit necessarily happily with the kind of the reality of evolution. I note that creationists are themselves fairly broad in their beliefs in terms of what they believe about how life um, did originate. And I wanted to finish this lecture by just highlighting that there are um, dissenting voices um, and the tactics of these groups that don't choose to support evolution have changed over the years. What started as fairly dogmatic and ideology-based arguments of no, that doesn't agree with my worldview, have since been rebranded re creation science. With this, there was a shift from trying to ban the teaching of evolution outright to teaching creationism alongside evolution. And creation science has tended to make the case that it is using the scientific method to disprove evolution. That eventually um, was proven unconstitutional in the US in, in court, and indeed um, none of the science, scientific evidence that has been offered has shifted the consensus view of the scientists studying evolution. And that led to a further rebranded movement that was more recently called intelligent design. So this is not a movement that has argued um, that life is too complex to have evolved, and rather it must have been designed, and so 
in the worldview of this group, that then defaults to a, the Christian God, because this is a, a Christian organisation or Christian idea. And a, a famous example of this that they've used to try and disprove evolution and to sh demonstrate irreducible complexity is the bacterial flagellum. These long um, things that are shown um, emanating from this bacterium on the left-hand image here. So these bacteria use a flagellum to repel themselves um, to move. And the argument is that this is too complex to have evolved using the processes that we have met uh, today. And over the, you know, so this isn't the product of evolution. In recent years, research has shown unequivocally that actually this structure has evolved through modification of another structure called a type three secretion system or a molecular syringe. You can see the building blocks of a flagellum in the middle here, and the building blocks with the related structures labeled or color-coded in the same colors of an injectosome or a type three secretion system on the right-hand side here. This secretion system is present in some really nasty bacteria, where it's used to inject proteins into often eukaryotes, so more complex, I suppose, um, if we can say use those words, cells. Um, and the idea is that these proteins will subvert the host's cell biology to the bacterium's advantage. And so actually this idea of irreducible complexity um, shone a light on something we don't we didn't understand fully and lots of research has gone into now fully understanding that and shows a naturalistic explanation for this feature. And since that point, the teaching of this has now been considered in breach of the US Constitution. As such, and since that point, one of the newer tactics of this movement has been to rebrand the same kind of arguments as critical analysis of evolutionary theory. So, I mean, this is a continuing and adapting and a very human situation. So bear in mind that I presented in this video lots of lines of evidence that very, very strongly, in my view, support evolution, and that there are movements out there um, who, on the basis of a number of generally, generally ideological uh, uh, belief systems, uh, choose not to um, believe that the evidence that I've shown you is true. So that was an introduction to why I believe evolution is true. And in the next video, we're going to dig deeper into some of the mechanics of evolution. I'll see you there shortly.